Alright, so we got here on time. I don't think I told y'all this last week, but we got in the car last week and we pulled out of the driveway and we were headed to the ice machine. And by the time we got to the intersection, we went, oh, we forgot the trailer. <laughs> totally. So we had to go ahead and get the ice because we were there. And then we turned around and went and got the trailer. And we got back on the road and then we went, oh, we forgot the cookies. So we just stopped at the store for cookies. So this week we got the cookies, we got the trailer, we got the ice. I think we got everything that we needed. We got here on time. We set up on time. We are starting on time. Go, Jesus. And it's a brand new sound system. And it is a brand Remember last week our speakers went out, so Darren built a brand, brand new sound system this, this past week. Um, and um, so we tried it. We know that it works, but yes. we just hadn't done this with we it. We haven't so. tried it in this scenario. We did try it in the house and, um, and whatnot, but I think we have everything going. Animals are always worse than at my place. Do y'all want me to come preach from there? Y'all know I'll do it. No, I sit on the middle part and hurt my Christian. Oh, but if you sit in two, it's much easier. I know, I do. Oh, okay. And I sit on the top of me and So you should have got a worship sheet that says um, the quote of the week is you can see God from anywhere if your mind is set to love and obey yeah. Him. Come on. That is it. You have weather for the week. And um, oh, and I both lost for today. I said it was going to be 84. She said it was going to be 89. It bumped over 90, which 90 is our scale for the swamp cooler, which we don't have today because we thought it was either going to be 84 or 89. But we have a sound system. But we do have a working sound system. Go, Jesus. Every day. Um, yeah, I mean, seriously. back to the house. And no trips back to the house. So that was just, yes, one trip from the house. Totally awesome. We talked to the gentleman coming up. All right, so then there's a Charlie Brown cartoon on here that says, you know what's funny? Paintings of Adam and Eve where they both have belly buttons. Think about that. Take as much time as you need. <laughs> Adam and Eve don't have belly buttons. So David, there you go. Right? David read that and said, is he making to <laughs> Come, Yes, David. Take as much time as you need, baby. <laughs> anyway, so um, we're going to get started. I am super excited today because Michael is bringing the word, and that is so super neat. Woo! And yay! <laughs> and um, good food, good company, good Jesus. Just good all the way around. Good family. So, good family. Um, a couple of things. Can I? Um, Y'all be in prayer for Jeanette and her brother and her sister. Her mom passed away this morning. Oh, oh. Um, Which is a blessing because she's been suffering with cancer for a very long time. And her is with Jesus. She's not in pain no more. Yes. So, I am excited about that because I can't wait to be there personally. I can't wait to take half a breath here and the rest of my breath there. I'm going to start the name Jesus here, and I'm going to finish Jesus there, and I cannot wait to step before him. Um, then another prayer request is um, Londa, who has come several times to Bible study and has preached a few times for me. Um, she tragically lost her son um, Wednesday night. Um, just graduated high school last year. He was at a pool party. And some thugs rolled up and opened fire, and he was trying to get some people out of the way to safety, and he got shot three times in the stomach. So, life is short, y'all. Whether you're 19 or 99, um, King Solomon said that this life is like a vapor. It's gone. I mean, what is... Okay, so I'm a little creepy, y'all. I like to look at the medical examiner's website. And um, I look to see when our folks have passed away, and I keep track on what their cause of death is, and I look at stuff. But I also look at what's going on in the world. And, and so I'll look at how many suicides there were, and it just burdens my heart and whatever. But on the Tarrant County website, there was a, a gentleman who passed away at 102, and I was like, oh, go, that's 102, that's awesome. Although I don't want to live to be 102. <laughs> anyway, when I went to the Dallas County website, there was a lady that passed away this past week that was 105. Nice. That is awesome. I was like, uh. <laughs> you know, we all. Go, Jesus. I read this week that we all want to live a long life until we get old. 
And that's because it hurts to get out of bed in the morning. But, anyway, so, you know, Solomon had said, life is but a vapor. So whether it's 102 years or 105 years or 99 years or 19 years, what is that in comparison to all of eternity? Forever and ever, for all of eternity, that amount of time is just not even the blink of an eye. And no, the end ever is not necessary. But ever pretty much cut forever covers it. Um, but what we need to be mindful of, what we need to be mindful of, is what are we doing with our time while we're here? We have one chance to make a mark on the world around us and to leave God's fingerprint with His DNA within us and save as many people possible, bring Him glory. That's that's what we're here for. And so, um, just be in prayer for those that have lost loved ones this week and, and know that life is short. Make a difference. Make a difference. Um, and then we have the normal announcements. we got the birthday list, the needs list. I'm going to come over there, y'all. I'm sorry. He's talking and he won't stop. Trent, <laughs> I'm going to separate you. I'm going to put you in time out. Put him over that way. <laughs> like way over there. Then we also have our uh, American GI form that's got resources and information for you. You don't have to be a veteran to get resources from them, but they are great at helping you look for a job, job prep, job training, job resume, etc. And so, um, and then if you have any questions on that, talk to Cowboy. And then, um, don't forget Cloud Covered Streets. Don't forget we're going to be here on Wednesday for Bible study. And then our regular routine next week will probably be warm enough. We have our swamp tour. And so we'll put up the walls and pump in some cold air and have a break from the heat. Because it's Texas in summer, y'all. Um, but let's get going. Jesus, we thank you for today. We praise you for what you have done. We worship you for what you have done. We adore you, Father, for sending your Son, for creating things, for giving us life, for having a plan and purpose, for calling us home, for giving us just the opportunity to serve you and bring you glory. Holy Spirit, make your mark here today. Show us that you're here. Show us who you are. Give us the chance to show our heart of gratitude to you, Father, for everything, absolutely everything, because you are worthy to be praised. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. We're going to pour it out into the throne room. And may it bring a sweet incense like the prayers of the saints. In Jesus' name, amen. Go stand up and worship.
inside the worries of my day To quiet down my busy mind and find the hiding place Worthy You are worthy I open up my heart and let my spirit worship your Open up my mouth and let a song of praise come forth. Worthy, you are worthy. Of a childlike faith and of my honest praise, of my honest shame. Amen. 
We have raised a thousand voices Just to lift your holy name And we will raise thousands more To sing of your beauty in this place Oh, I'm not going to move on fathom No, I'll find it, find your word And as we marvel in your presence As we fall down before you, with our willing hearts we see, in the greatness of your glory. How are you guys doing today? Good. Doing well? It's a really pretty day out today. I'm happy about that. All right. Did you guys know that the King of England can't have a passport or a driver's license? You guys know that? You know why he can't? Because there's no one higher than him to give him one. <laughs> inside of England, inside of the kingdom, the king's the highest person. So, everything under in that nation is under is given by him. So when they give someone a driver's license, when they give someone a passport, they say, this is given to you in the name of the king. So no, he can't have
have one. Can you imagine that? You can't give him, you can't give yourself a passport. You just, you are a passport. <laughs> Someone compares you to the picture of the king and they're like, yeah, that looks about right. You can, go, you can do whatever you want. Because that's the highest authority. And that's even more so in England where the king isn't just the political leader, but he's also the head of the church. It's the same person in one, right? And that's kind of how the world sees a king as the highest power in the land. Yeah. But no one else is higher than the, that king, right? No one else can, no one can say no to the king. If another political branch wants to ask him to do something, they can't tell him to do it. They gotta ask him politely and mm -hmm. hope that he acquiesces to what they want. Right. <laughs> right. There's nothing that they can do about it, right? Yeah. And so I'm gonna continue my story on David. That last time I spoke about David, it was cave, David and Goliath. You guys probably remember the story of David and Goliath. But now we're going to look, that was like his greatest triumph, right? Not his greatest triumph, but one of his most well-known triumphs. Right. And now I'm going to go and look at one of his greatest defeats. Mm -hmm. His moral defeat. Right? We're going to look at the story of, uh, oh man, I skipped forward. No, backwards. David and Bathsheba. You guys know this story, right? Yeah. The infamous story where David chose to do what he wasn't supposed to be doing, right? But the funny thing is, what people don't realize is in this story, by the worldly perspective, he did absolutely nothing wrong. Everything that he did was completely legal for him to do as king. No one argued with him. No one said, David, King David, you shouldn't really be doing that. Because he had a legal right to do everything he did. He was underneath his own authority, and God was the only one considered above him. So everything he did was completely legal, because all the laws in the land were considered to be distributed by him. Who do you go to when the guy that's, that writes the laws is doing something against the law. Right. He's still being judge. He's just like, no, I'm innocent. Bangs his gavel and it all goes away. Right? right? You can't do anything about it. So let's see what happens. Now, this is actually a really scathing, like, critique of David. You guys probably haven't read it through with all the subtext in this chapter. So I'm going to go ahead and read a a parable from his son. You guys remember his son wrote the Psalms. So, Psalm sorry, Psalm 6 verse 20 warning against adultery. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always in your heart. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you wake, they will speak to you. For his command is a lamp, this teaching is a light. And correction and instruction are the way to life. Keeping you from your neighbor's wife. From the smooth talk of a wayward woman. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captive captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot. 
and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, however great it is. Now this is David's son, and I, I think I know where he learned about adultery from <laughs> in our chapter here in a minute. So first thing we hear, it happened, this is 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab the, and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon, and besieged Robah. But David remained at Jerusalem. So, first things first. Do you see a problem with that? Oh, man. Oh, you see a problem with that? It says that this is the time where the kings are supposed to be at battle. They're supposed to be leading the troops. Where's David? At home. He's at home. He's not leading the troops. He's not in battle. He's not doing his job. He has one job, to go and lead the kings in battle, lead his people in battle. And yet he's sending his servants to go and lead the troops. Then we get into trouble. When it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Urah the Hittite? So, you can see, David's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's not doing his job. And in the middle of the night, or at some time when he's supposed to be sleeping, he gets up, probably out of boredom, and goes and sees a woman where he's not supposed to be. And then he sins for her. Right? Which is another thing that he's not supposed to do because he's being told right now by his servant, this is someone's wife. Right? And again, what's going to happen is all perfectly legal in this land because he is the king. And the king cannot do anything illegal because he's the one that writes the laws. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba? I already said that. Not only, though, is this not just one of his people, this is a Hittite. This is a foreigner. And one thing that you know about the king is that this man's house is right next to the palace. And in this culture and time period, to be the highest level person in the kingdom is right around the palace. They get the most access to the king. So this is not, this is a trusted servant. And not only that, but he's not even under his kingdom. He's from another nation. So that's an even another level of trust that's been put inside this man that's underneath David. So he chooses to go after her and sins for her. And since this is all legal and you can't say no to the king, he can legally have you killed for whatever reason he chooses. He sins for her. Then comes another problem. Let me just skip forward a little bit. They find out that she is pregnant. She has a child on the way. And it could not possibly be the husband, because he was at war. Right? <laughs> so, what are they going to do? So, David sends for Urah, uh, is that right? Urai, the Hittite. Send me, oh, we're picking up in six. Then David said to Joab, saying, send me Urah, the Hittite. And Joab sent Urah to David. When Urah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war pro uh, prospered. 
And David said to Urah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Urah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Urah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to the house. Can you guys imagine that? You just get back from a war campaign. You're called back early where your friends are currently fighting. You're called to come and have a feast with the king. And he chooses not to go back to his house with his wife, but instead sleeps out with the servants and refuses to go home. Now, it doesn't say why Ura did this, but we have several different options to choose from, right? One option is, this guy has absolutely no idea about the undercurrents of what's happening. He doesn't know about what's, what's going on with his wife. And he's just being very angry about how the king isn't currently in battle with his troops. And that he's just sure, and he's very angry at the fact that he was called back when his friends are currently dying in the war. And he's just choosing not to go back out of principle. That's one option. The other option, which is I think the more, the, the option I think is true, is that he actually knows what happened. And that he's sure he knows what happened because nothing was secret. David didn't keep it secret. Everything he did was lawful. He sent servants to go and fetch them. Everybody knows what happened. Right? It's actually said that in this the fact is, David didn't take her as his wife, which was what would be custom, would be to take her as his wife. They'd take her out of the household and take her on as one of his own wives. But he chose not to do that, but actually rejected her and chose to leave her out and is leaving this child fatherless. And that he no longer, he does not have a household because he was rejected by the father and is no longer in the line of succession. If he had accepted her as a wife, the child would have a line to the throne. He would have an option of perhaps living in the palace, if not taking the throne one day. But because he rejected her and sent her back home, that all that child's possible chance for royalty is completely cut off. Not only that, but he's trying to get him to acknowledge the child as his own by sending him back to his wife so that he loses out on all that thing. So, he could be doing it for his wife so that she could have a place in the palace. He could be doing it because he's very vengeful and angry about what he did while he was away fighting for him and doing his job. Or maybe he's doing it for his son so that his son could possibly have a chance at a royal life in the kingdom. Or it could be all of the above. And it's all of these things. Because there, all these things were happening at the time. Not exactly sure because it doesn't tell Uriah's circumstance, Uriah's thoughts. Uh, so Uriah departed from the king's house and gifts of food followed. The king followed him. There we go. Number... Verse 9, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all of the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. So when David, when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and, uh, and Judah are, all, are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Job and his servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go down to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my wife? I feel like there was extra emphasis on the wife part. <laughs> As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. So he's calling him out on all his hypocrisy and all the things he's supposed to be doing, knowingly or not, 
saying, I'm not going to do this when all these things are going on. It's not my right. I'm not privileged enough to do that. Then David said to Urah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Urah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now then David called him. He ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. So that was David's second attempt. Make him drunk, then hopefully he'll wander home, and he'll be able to say, you slept with your wife, it's not on me anymore. But it didn't work. He still kept, even in drunkenness, still kept to his, his guns and stayed there and slept on the ground with the servants. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Urah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Let Urah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. Holy cow. That's a big jump if you ask me. <laughs> he went for trying to get him drunk to go back to his wife to sending a death warrant. And not only just sending out a death warrant for him, but making him carry the death warrant <laughs> to the guy that was supposed to give it out. Can you imagine that? You carrying your own, like, warrant for your own arrest to the guy who's supposed to arrest you? Normally you'd send somebody else. He has lots of servants. He didn't have to do that. But he did. He chose to do that. So it was while Job besieged the city that he assigned Urah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and sought for Joab. And, and some of the men of the servants of David fell, and Urah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath arises, if he gets angry, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they, were sh they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abelech, the son of Jerusalem? Was it not a woman who cast an, uh, a piece of a millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thesbeth? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Urah the Hittite is dead also. <laughs> so if David gets angry at me for doing a bad job and letting people die, remind him that the guy you asked to be uh, die is dead. <laughs> Just remind him of this fact so that he won't get mad at me for doing a bad job because you asked me to do a bad job. Yeah. <laughs> so the messenger went and came to David, all that, and, and came and told David all that he had sent him by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. When we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate, the archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant, Urah, the Hittite, is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. So he's like, okay, the job's done. The guy that was in my way is out of my way. Now just do your job. Do, do, do it. Take over the city. When the wife of Urah heard that Urah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her 
mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So, he did a bad thing. He did something that wasn't supposed to do. He committed murder. He committed adultery. He manipulated everybody around him. And all of this was legal by human standards. But the only one above him is now going to call him to account. And we're going to see what happens because Samuel comes in the mix now. Nathan's parable and David's confession. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his food, own food and drank from his own cup and lay on his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take his from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one of the of one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So they, Samuel brought a message to David. And this message hit home. Because David was a was a herdman. His best friends when he was young, they were his sheep. He looked after them. And we knew he loved them so much because he was willing to face down lions and bears to keep them safe. A normal shepherd would not do that. A normal shepherd would go... A lion took one of my sheep. I'm not paid enough for this. I'll let this one go, and well, I'll keep the rest safe. But David was different. In his youth, he chased down the lion. He chased down the bear. He not only chased them down and rescued the lamb, but he beat the lion and the lamb to death with a club. Which is an amazing feat all on its own. God was with him, and he gave him the ability for that. So here with his message, David isn't just being told a great grievance that's been come against him, but he's reminding him of his youth and the man he was before the world came and tainted him. Before the world came and gave him absolute power over life and death. When there was simple justice between you and your lamb, and you and the thing coming against you. Where life was simple and there was good laws and pure intent going between you and what was around you. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall, sur shall, sur shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold from for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Oh, then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your, into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if you had been too little, I also would have given you much more. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you displeased, despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Urah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife 
to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have displeased me, and have taken the wife of Urah the Hittite to be your wife. That's pretty, that's pretty damning, isn't it? Yeah. That God called him back to who he was, and David had repented, right? He did say sorry for what he did. And hopefully he learned, and from what his son learned from wisdom about not being, having, being adulterous, I think he probably taught his son that too. Because the thing is, repentance is for everybody no matter what you do. That even the king in a land that can kill anybody in a moment's notice legally is under God's providence. Is underneath the Father's law. Is underneath a moral law from God. And not only that... Oh, I lost my train of thought. Because I was getting around to something else. <laughs> not only that alright let me go back where I was that the God is over even the king that no one else can go against him right that he is ultimately going to be accountable to the father, our father in heaven to right. God right. and when he got away that's right that's what I was going to talk about because God's kingdom is different than our kingdom. There's the world's way of doing things where the king is above anybody else and can kill anybody at any time and persecute anyone that he wants. And then there's God's way of doing things where he takes a little boy who looks after shepherds and worships God in his spare time who learns to play an instrument a minstrel and he takes them and he anoints him king over Israel. While the worldly king is out persecuting others and throwing throwing spears at little shepherds boys, he takes the weakest in a family and anoints him to be king over Israel. To take the king's place eventually when he dies. And that's what he was calling him back to. That boy that he raised up. That boy that knew that a king is supposed to look after the sheep. That he has sheep in the kingdom. He has people he's supposed to be looking after. After Has people in the kingdom that he's meant to be looking after. But he's not. He was taking advantage of them. He was not looking out for them. He was not even doing his own job. And was sitting at home. So he could take advantage of them more while the men were away. That is egregious attitude for someone that's supposed to follow God's way of doing things. God's laws. But he found redemption. Because he did say, sorry, he did apologize to God. And God still kept him as king. He did not usurp him like he did Saul. Because he found redemption. And that's the difference between Saul and David. Right. When Saul did something bad, he's like, I'm the king. I can do what I want. Right. And he did not repent. Yeah. When David did something wrong, he wrote psalms about how he did wrong. Right. <laughs> and apologized to God in those psalms. We've got the psalms. How many of those are about him being like, oh God, I did wrong, please look after me. Oh God, please help me. I'm doing everything's going bad. Help me in this time. I know I did wrong. David had a heart of a worshiper. And that is truly what we need to have. Is a heart of a worshiper. Someone who's willing to repent even in the smaller things when we do wrong, when we transgress against him. Even though we have the complete the right to do it, we can still fall short of God's laws. Because there's man's laws, and it's backwards. Man's laws says you can do certain things that you aren't really supposed to be doing. 
man's law says you can do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting somebody else. But God's law says different. That just because you can do something, just because you have the legal right to do something, doesn't necessarily mean you should be doing something. Because legally isn't right. God's will for our lives, for our heart, and changing what is in it to focus on Him, to worship Him, to know that, to look after the people around us, the flocks around us, to take care of those around us, is the highest form of religion in loving our Father. Because Jesus said that the highest, that the most important of God's laws is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what David forgot. He forgot to love his neighbor. Instead, he lusted after his neighbor. Instead, he pursued his neighbor in an unhealthy way. And that's not right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come here to learn more about you. That you are a good father that looks after us. That helps us to be good shepherds like David was. That helps us to become good people that love our neighbor as we love ourselves. To look after other people. To not fall to the worldly ways, but instead to your ways. To set our hearts to where we will not desire those evil things of the world. So we will not desire to hurt others, but to love others and to pursue you in worship, in love, and in the way we treat other people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And bless our food. <laughs> bless our food. this card then you know and we talked about it last week but this is Michael's last Saturday with us he's still going to be doing um, uh, Bible study and stuff so we have something for you uh, Michael we greatly appreciate everything that you have brought to us the list is long the list is very long we can only hope to stay in your footsteps <laughs> I knew you would